I will start in a few minutes. Let's a few late people to come in. So no quiz today. I think I repeated a couple of times on Wednesday, but this week no quiz. In the future week there will be quizzes. Normally we would start, uh, you know, this one hour with the 15 minute or 10 minute quiz. But not today. You didn't learn enough to write any quiz here. Yeah, so there's no quiz today. So in general, like the main content of the lectures will be mostly covered in the two hours uh, lecture on Wednesday. When, as it happened last time, we had more questions and we didn't fully finish. Then I would finish up some of the uh, slides on Friday. And then I will do a little bit of recap summary of everything we learned that week. If something needs to be said specifically about the labs, I will cover that. And after that, we'll have some time for your questions. So the handing of the quiz, so the quiz will be on Quercus, right? So we will give you a link on where to set. So essentially it's a multiple choice questions there. So you're gonna just get a few questions. You just select some answers and that's it. It will be auto marked afterwards. Okay, I hope guys you can see my screen, right? And we will start in two minutes. In the meantime, you can ask questions if there are some questions that were still not clear. I think by now you should see, uh, you know, updated website that has the labs, the tutorials, uh, uh, sort of tutorials will be posted today. It would have the lab handout. This tutorial today will be posted later on online as well you'll have all the information and the video for it. And the video of the lecture is also posted. I think there should be a pre-lab follow-up one. So you should just carefully read the handout. If you're not sure about something about pre-lab, post a question on Piazza. It's just the pre-lab follow-up one is very simple. Okay, if, if that's what handout says, then that's it. Yeah, then it's not needed. And uh, the next week quiz would cover the material of, uh, you know, this week as well. And maybe some part of the next week. Okay, let's start. So uh, the main plan for today is, first of all, uh, since we didn't cover a few uh, last slides uh, um, and you might forget some of the things you learned on Wednesday, I'll go through a very, very quick summary of what was covered on Wednesday. So just, just to refresh yourself a little bit, there's no new content there. Then I finish up a few missing slides towards the end and after that, uh, we will look at some examples of the potential questions you can get in the quiz. And we still should have some time afterwards, so you can still ask questions. Okay, so we, uh, in this uh, 
like in the first lecture, we covered some properties of electricity. We talk about semiconductor materials, uh, doping effects, n-type and p-type. We talk about p-n junctions, and we talk about transistors and how we build them. So uh, we we'll also talk about the architecture of the computer hardware. Remember, we were telling you that we're going to build everything from the ground zero. So we're going to go from physics, from electrons into transistors. Transistors allow you to build gates. Uh, from gates, you can build circuits. From circuits, you can build devices. And more complicated things like add, uh, you know, or multiply. That's something we're going to learn in this class. This is what helps us compute things. We're also going to learn about flip-flops, finite state machines, and that helps us to store data, to remember things like memory. Computation plus memory allows us to build processes. And on top of processes, we were going to learn the assembly language. That's the language that the processor understands. And that's a different language from what, from the high level language you usually use to program. So a lot of uh, time last time was dedicated to transistors. So again, I just repeat the outline of the story. We covered a lot on the basics of the electricity. We're not going to grill you on that too much. It's just for your better understanding how things work. If you don't remember them from high school, or if you didn't cover that in high school, we talk about insulate, insulators and conductors, right? And obviously something in between, semiconductors, then P and type doping, P and junctions. Uh, then principle of transistors, how we apply voltage to different ends of the PN junctions and the MOSFET. So essentially the logical diagram, diagram should be now clear for you, is that everything in your process is built out of logic gates. Those logic gates are built out, out of transistors. And we will repeat again, we'll show you how they're physically built. Transistors are built on top of technology that is called PN junctions. PN junctions are made of the semiconductor materials and semiconductors just use the basic principle of the electricity to do the conduction part. The key feature of the semiconductors is they're not as the regular wire, they just let the electricity go through. We can apply different states, electricity and no electricity to the, to the gate and that would allow us either to stop the flow or let the flow. It's like you know, uh, it's like as, as a pipe with water, you, you want to be able to close it or open it. So we use semiconductors the same, absolutely the same way. Okay, any questions so far? This is, we're just repeating everything from the last lecture. So PN junctions. So, uh, so we covered different types of materials of P-type and N-type. So I'll just repeat it very briefly for you so that you remember it. So we started with a neutral, very stable uh, material such as silicon or germanium. So this is shows in uh, you know yellow here. And uh, the thing about it is that it can be modified relatively straightforwardly. That's a good feature of silicon without uh, being broken. And you can change it in two major ways. You can either add uh, you know elements with a bigger valency, like phosphorus that has a valence of five versus silicon that have four, and that would bring an extra electrons there. The material itself is still stable, but you get a little bit of an instability because of this electron, but it's still neutral by default. P-type, so it becomes kind of, it's called N-type because it gets some free electrons that are not as stable as everything else. And then you can bring boron to the, for the P-type materials, that has a valence of three, so it doesn't have one connection here. You see it's missing. Because it's missing, you're gonna get kind of like a, and a hole, a virtual thing that attracts electron. So essentially then, if you take these two piece materials, like a sandwich, and bring them close together, the electrons from the N type will be attracted by these holes, right? That's gonna create some movement there if you bring them close enough, right? So essentially this uh, forward direction of electrons from, you know, from the N layer to the P layer, it's got a name, right? It's called diffusion. And when this happens, 
the uh, original phosphorus atom that were neutral becomes positive. So you get plus everywhere you get a phosphorus because they just kind of lost their electrons. And boron atoms, because they gain electron, will become negative, right? So overall, you can think about this as getting some potential of pluses and minuses. When you get that, when you get plus and minus, that that's like your battery that you use, you know, everywhere. You create an electric field because there is now a flow of electrons back and forward, similar to the spring. So electron movement drawn by the electric field brings electrons back. So there are essentially two processes, the forward process called diffusion, that's uh, when we bring two materials together. And then after we get plus and minus potential, then the electron starts to move back, brought, uh, drawn by the electric field, uh, created by the loss in the original material. So this is the same thing as spring that goes up and down, up and bound when you add a weight. Because of that, uh, you create essentially, uh, you know, this diffusion and drift type of thing that eventually stabilize, right? So when this uh, equilibrium is reached, we essentially get a certain width of uh, a layer in between two materials, and that layer is called depletion layer. So this is the layer where the exchange of electrons happened and we reach some stability. So the thing about it, and this thing is called PN junctions because it consists of two types of materials. P material with those holes attracted uh, by the electrons and by the n-type material. Okay, so this is just PN junctions, right? This is a building block. This by itself won't let me build a transistor, right? It just creates me something that is stable if I don't do anything, but it can change if I start to apply voltage to it, right? So remember, PN junction by itself is still neutral. It just had this instability in it uh, that we can play with in the depletion layer. Okay, any questions, guys? Is this clear? Because that's critical to understand. Okay, if there is no question, and if this is all repetition from the lecture. So when we get this somewhat unstable thing, we can apply electricity to a different ends of it, right? And we can see the two options, apply positive voltage to the P side or apply positive voltage to the N side. And the first case is called forward bias. If you're gonna do that, as I showed in the previous lecture, depletion layer would become more narrow. When it's more narrow, it's easier to throw through it. It's not, right now depletion layer serves like a blocking point between two layers. If I make it more narrow, it's easier to electron to travel through it. So it makes better conductivity because really the electricity happens because electrons can move and then it becomes like a switch connected. So you virtually can think about as a switch on or off, right? When I make it too narrow, electricity starts to move, so the switch is on. If you apply it in a reverse order, you get a reverse bias, the depletion layer becomes wider, it's harder to travel through it, it makes conductivity worse, and the switch becomes disconnected. So we're just building something that can be on and off right? This is how the transistor works. So the transistor is this building work that can be on and off. So this is important building block to create a real blown, uh, real uh, practical transistors that called MOSFET. There are multiple different transistors, but we are essentially focusing on the MOSFETs because that's the most widely used. So how are those guys operating? So the way to think about it, there is a source and the drain, right? This is uh, two ends to which electricity can apply it, and there is a gate that we want to build. So the best way to think of the gate, it can be closed or open, depending whether you uh, turn counterclockwise or clockwise, right? So the way we built uh, essentially uh, a MOSFET transistor is it consists of three major parts, really, to be honest. It has a metal, it has the oxide, the metal, 
is used when you want to improve conductivity. The oxide is used as an insulator. If you want electricity not to come here, then you use an oxide level. And we use n-type, p-type material to create, uh, you know, to play with the depletion layer. So what, so that's insulator, this is conductor, it can apply electric charge there. And this is semiconductors that adopt with either N-type or P-type material. So essentially, uh, source and drain are built typically with um, an N-type material, right? And we place them into inside a P-type material, a P-substrate, right? So each of them has their tiny little depletion layer, right? Based, because it's P and N, right? So you always get it. So how we build, uh, why MOSFET consists of metal and oxide, right? So the um, oxide layer uh, doesn't conduct electricity. A metal layer is used for the gate. So why is it needed? If I bring a metal to the gate, right, that it can create an electric charge applied to it, right, when the electric charge applied to it. So it can bring, for example, if I bring a P to it, right, so if I bring a positive charge to it, it starts attract the electron. So essentially you have these two pockets with a source and drain, right, that are isolated, so you don't really have any conductivity on the top. Why this happens? Because we want to create a direct channel between them. So we don't want electricity to drain or move somewhere else. So it's isolated, source and drain isolated here. Right? As you guys, guys can see my mouse, right? So this is the source and then drain. And this is the gate to which we can apply electricity if we want, and we want to connect them. Source and drains are very symmetric. They might be in practice done slightly differently, but from the perspective of these lectures, they build identically, right? They all build from the same type of N material and they both isolated, right? It's just one is a source and another is a direction of the drain. Okay. Then a voltage is applied across the two N type sections called the drain and the source and no current will pass between them though, because they are isolated by the P sections. So then when we're gonna apply, okay, I guess I get another question. Uh, no, uh, we will force, um, you, if we wouldn't do anything, the direction can be any way, but we're gonna apply voltage in a certain way. So the direction of the current would be specific. Right, so we'll make the direction from source to drain. They're not called by light like that, but at the beginning they're symmetric. So what we're gonna do, we will show how the electricity can change the story. So first we're gonna connect them, and you see we're gonna connect them not randomly, it's gonna be connected plus and here and minus and here, right? That's gonna reverse, remember we talk about reverse bias, when I'm gonna get, uh, you know, a charge, we're going to get a depletion layer is going to extend, right? If you apply this way, this depletion layer will uh, extend with the reverse bias. So you see, depending on how I apply electricity, either one layer get bigger depletion layer or another one. So just to reiterate on the questions previously asked, at the desi original design, source and drain are symmetric but depending on how we apply charge to them, they start to get a different size of the depletion layer. Okay, so when this happens, we can then, you see, can add a metal here with some charge to it, which can start to attract some electrons from the P material in between these two, okay? Yes, the depletion layer on the other end can get smaller if you apply negative fuel rate. So uh, what really happens is that by doing the manipulations with the, how much electricity we apply, we can make the channel wider or more narrow. 
So essentially what's gonna happen, one is reverse biased, right? And then you add a metal here, right? The metal you also connect with plus and minus here, you see? This is where they become asymmetric. And then, since there is a plus charge here, surprise, surprise, they're gonna attract some electrons. And that electrons attracted here create us some virtual channel that would allow to flow electricity between these two, right? So that creates a so-called N-type channel that allow the electricity to flow between source to gate. And we make it such that you see it, it's in a certain shape. So it allows the, uh, it creates a path to, uh, for their you know, electricity to flow from the source to the drain. Okay. Questions? Um, so yes, the, 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 the result, like it's one thing to understand that when I talk about on and off switch, this is an abstraction. Electricity always falls. It's just electrons can always move. It's just the probability and the chance they can move is really small, so you can barely detect it. Every time we take about five volts or zero volts, they are never precisely five. There's always a noise. So in the textbook provided to you, if you read carefully, they talk about how to deal with this noise, right? But the matter is like in which direction it mostly happens. Okay, so I show you the, the basic type of transistor uh, that can be built. And that transistor, you see the diagram for it here. This is how it's gonna be used uh, in all your diagrams. That's called NMOS transistor. It has the source, the drain, and the gate. And this at the bottom is how it's physically built using PN junctions, right, principle, right? And some tricks with how we play the electricity. This is the drain, this is the source, right? And this is a P-type substrate. But we can also, and essentially in this design, conduct electricity happens when I apply a positive charge to this gate, right? When I make it plus, the system starts to work, create me a channel, and things go from source to drain. But you can make an inverse transistor called PMOS. So here everything is inverted, is essentially I don't put N material into P substrate, I put P material into N substrate. So instead of minuses here, you're gonna get pluses here. And that thing works when you had a closed switch, essentially when the uh, gate is logic zero, then it's activated. So from, uh, so it's essentially, it's the same story, it's just all inverted. Visual representation of the PMOS gate is like that. You see this circle here? It means it's kind of negated, right? So that when the gate is not activated, when it's zero, then these things is actually activated. So here you need to apply electricity to make it connected here. If you don't apply electricity, then it's connected. Oh yes, there is a big difference between the two and we're gonna talk about this in the future lectures a little bit today. You're gonna to see, we're gonna use both of them to build a real logical uh, uh, you know, circuits. Uh, they also have some physical difference in the implementations and area. So not everything is absolutely symmetric, but for the purposes of you, uh, in this class, you're gonna use one, uh, one you know, visual abstraction for this gate this way and another this gate, and that's the symbol we're gonna use, right? PMOS transistors is actually smaller, as far as I know, usually in modern technology, but logically they are very symmetric from the mathematical perspective. Any questions here? Okay. So just a few last bits is that essentially the way we think about um, the transistors, and I'll show you later, is that there is essentially a truth table to them. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we can make a current flow based on the current values of the voltages. So D stands for drain, S uh, for source, and G for ground. Uh, and essentially 
depending on where the volt, uh, what is the value of the voltages is, the transistors might be uh, activated or not, and it, it can either flow or doesn't flow. So we will now use these basic transistors to make, you know, our gates. Remember, we wanted to have something like not and and not and XOR. So I'll show you now how to build them using these two type of transistors, right? Okay. So the, the easiest possible transistor, or gate, sorry, gate that we can think about is the NOT gate. And this is how we're gonna build it. So uh, just stay with me here. So essentially, uh, how we're usually gonna build transistors, there is a place to which we apply a high level of electricity called VCC. And that's high input. For simplicity, that think about it, it's five volt. That was, was an early chip, so right now it's smaller but it's some high value, right? That goes into the system. Then the goal is to generate the value Y based in the into input A. And that value is generated whether the, based on whether electricity flows or doesn't flow. That's the truth table essentially. So let's say I want to build the inverter so the inverter has a very simple truth table, right? A NOT gate, sorry. So it has, when A is one, Y is zero. When A is zero, then Y is one. How would it happen in this case? How this transistor would, uh, how this transistors would make it big? So first of all, I already provided you with some design. Just follow with me to explain you how it works. So the electricity goes from here. This symbol is used for ground and this is for high voltage. So this is zero volt, this is five volts. So um, there are two transistors I use here. You see there is one with the circle here. This is the one of the, uh, that, uh, that's essentially that of the anti, uh, there's one in the end and one of the p-type. Um, I always forget myself which one is which, but essentially this one, when there's no electricity that's activated and this one is uh, activated only when there is electricity here. So what's going to happen is that the voltage goes here, right? It goes through this transistor. So let's say case one, if A is zero, if A is zero, this guy is going to close this gap, right? It's going to be activated. So the electricity is going to flow from here into Y and it's going to go there. But if, if it would be also connected to the drain, it will all go away here to the ground and that will become zero eventually. For this not to happen, we need to block this path. And that happens using the second transistor because A0 comes here, it means no electricity, and this is stays disconnected. So electricity only flows here, but it doesn't flow this way or that way because it blocks it. So essentially the value of A allows it to flow here, but not here. So this is why uh, the value uh, that five volts move into here and Y becomes one. So when A is zero, Y becomes one. Is this part clear to everyone? Any questions here? So the, our goal is based on specific input to the gate made the output also the way you would want based on the truth table, okay? More importantly, this also works symmetrically. When A is one, these guys got disconnected. So the electricity doesn't flow here and this is connected. So any electricity possible there would go to the ground. So that really makes that zero for sure. So if A is one, what's gonna happen is this guy got disconnected. Right? So it means that electricity from here doesn't flow this way, right? So you cannot get any electricity from VCC. And even there was any leftover electricity in the Y before, it's gonna be drained here because this now is connected, it's gonna flow in here. So what, you're not gonna get any new electricity this path and anything that was possible to have here before will, will be drained. Does this answer your question? Okay. 
Well, by default, there shouldn't be no electricity there, but remember the transistors might be used multiple times. So it might have some leftover that would generate some noise, but the drain makes sure that everything goes there. Something that non-zero always goes to zero. It's like water. If you have a leakage on your pipe somewhere on the floor, if you have a hole in the floor, eventually that water is going to find this hole. You just need to make sure that this channel is there for it to go. Is this clear? So why it doesn't have any electricity coming from VCC, but if it has anything left over, some potential, it might. Yes. Yep, that's correct. So, so it's, it's essentially the, uh, the, we always use the ground to make sure that whatever left over electricity, it will go away, right? That's how the electricity works. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. So we just built pretty much from the ground zero our first NOT gate using PN junction. So you, at least you now should feel at this moment, everything we learned was not a waste of time. We just start to build things. Now uh, we can move and build more complicated stuff. And um, I'm not gonna go carefully with it, but you can do apply the same trick and see how things would work uh, with this transistor. So the same principle as before, and this guy will give you an AND gate. So you see uh, the truth table for AND is quite simple. It needs to be both A and B1 for this to, for Y to become one. And that's exactly what's written here. When electricity goes here, A is one that's connected, B is one that's connected, and the electricity goes there, right? So, and it won't go there because these two uh, would be essentially not activated, okay? So it won't go to the ground, but it would go to Y. So it's gonna flow this way, but not this way. And that's the only way. If you had any other combinations of zeros and ones for A and B, this won't go through, uh, and that would drain whatever, is, uh, whatever Y had. So this is uh, an AND thing, and you can, you know, if you are not sure, you can try home with different values. I'm just showing you that uh, the designs of it. And this is how the OR would be designed, right? And this is how something more complicated like SOAR would be designed. So this is how you build logic gates out of these NMP and uh, NMOS and PMOS transistors. Why are the gates below the Y in the first diagram? It doesn't matter. This is just a diagram that like things can be inverted. It's just for convenience of representation. Okay, so uh, so this is uh, shows you the diagrams. As you can see, com uh, complexity of different logic gates can be very different. So mathematically, and or XOR are more or less equal, but implementation of them in the, the physical uh, NMOS and PMOS transistors can vary. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, the coloring scheme, my, uh, the, what matters is that they have circle or not. There is one, some copy paste that makes the, the difference in colors, but there is no like big meaning in the difference. So it really matters whether you have a circle or you don't. Okay. So in the interest of time, let's move on and you can ask some questions towards the end. So, uh, so I show you the designs of so several of these, uh, you know, logic gates. Um, the one of the most interesting is the one called an NAND, and why it's interesting, it's it's the one of the cheapest to build, and it's the cool thing about it. Everything else can be built out of it, and or anything can be implemented using only an uh, NAND, and that makes it functionally complete. While say and alone won't be enough. You need and and not to build everything else. So 
one exercise for you to try at home is try to implement all different logical operators and or not XOR using logical NAND. You cannot completely remove the ground. Someone already answered that. You, uh, the ground does always exist to have the noise. If you ever played with an electricity, you know what, you always need to make your stuff grounded. So there's no like leftover current there because it may always be there. So you always need to make sure it's either redirected into the ground or it's drained before you, you start to run your experiments. Otherwise it's gonna create you a lot of noise. Does this answer your question? why the ground exists. Okay. So essentially this is like an exercise for itself. It, you don't need to use NMOS PMOS for this exercise. You're really just trying to use logical and NAND to build other elements. Those are just abbreviations of the standard voltages that apply it. You can always think about it because I copy pasted it from different grounds. Sometimes it's called VCC, sometimes it's called VDD. Uh, and that really means that there is some voltage coming here, certain potential one in other cases it doesn't. Okay, uh, Yan, you asked about how the ground works on, for diagram one in the previous slide. In the previous slide, I have three different diagrams. Which one do you want to be covered? And or OXOR. Okay, let's try to cover this again. So we want to generate an AND. A truth table for AND is very simple. If A and B are both ones, then the Y is also one. So let's see where, how we can get it. So let's say we apply some electricity coming from here from the top uh, called common collector voltage, like five volts. The ground, as I said, is always zeros. So if A is one, the switch is on, the gate is on, and B is one, this is on. So the electricity is gonna flow from here to here. It's gonna reach Y. The question though is, is it gonna to go to the ground? Because if that's also connected and all this thing will eventually leak from here into the ground and dissipate. For this not to happen, we had a, you know, a P type transistors, that uh, PMOS transistors that actually uh, disconnected when A is one and when this is one. So essentially, uh, you are not going to go neither through this channel is disconnected, neither through this channel, through this wire, because it's disconnected. So there, the electricity is only going to flow this way, but not this way. There's nowhere to go here, because this is disconnected. Okay, that is when A and B are both one. Any other combination, let's say A is one and B is zero. So if that happens, if B is zero, first of all, electricity doesn't go through here because that guy is disconnected. So Y is not gonna get anything, uh, any electricity from here. And you're gonna connect, uh, so because B is zero, right? That becomes activated. So any leftover from here is gonna go take this path and go away to ground. Does it answer your question? And you can do the inverse for when A is zero and B, yeah. Okay. It comes from Y to the ground because this is exactly the same as um, how water always goes to the hole. If you had water on the floor and you're gonna drill a hole in the floor, higher potential always goes down, right? So the water always goes to the hole. So the same with electricity. If there is some electricity here and there is zero electricity there, electrons are always gonna go through the wires to the lower level. It's like if you had a water on top of something, if you're gonna give a pipe and open the pipe, the water is gonna go through it. So it's exactly the same principle. 
Yeah, and does it answer your question? And why it goes? Because the value B equals zero make these things connected. So there is a pipe to go through, the pipe is open. Yes, that's correct. Aria asks when A, B is zero, the remaining electricity is drained. Yes, that's correct. Yes, so the switches with the circuits are negated, right? They activate it when uh, the input is zero. That's the difference from the ones that doesn't have a circle. That's what I covered like 10 minutes ago. Okay, any other questions left here? Okay, let's move on. So you're gonna use these things to build these logical gates, but after, like, we really just explain you once how you build them. In the future, you're gonna use logical and or logical or. But I want to understand you the physical principles that allows us to build them. Then you understand they're not equal because when you take a theory, a theory class or math class, and or not is just is symbol to you. They all look equivalent, but in practice, physically, they are different. So they take different amount of area, they build out of slightly different transistors. But you understand right now, if you know, your younger sibling would ask you how the real transistor work, you should be able to explain them from the material perspective, that you take silicon, you make it a little bit imperfect, then you apply electricity to it, it creates some current, and this is, becomes a building block to build any gate. So you understand from the physical material how they're like any element of the computer is built. Okay, I don't understand the questions for which diagram. So the Fonandi gates here, you had two sources of electricity applied. You see here and here, and these two things are parallel and these two things are sequential. Yeah. And this is your output. Yeah. Okay, you can check the, the truth table and whether it works or not. Okay, yeah. There's no surprises here. This is the simplest possible built-in block, yeah. But you can see that the interesting stuff, like those things are different. So these things needs two transistors, two of one type and two of another type. And if you go to the previous slide, you would see some other things. For example, XOR is way more expensive. It requires four transistors here and four transistors here, so eight transistors total. Also remember that transistors are not always equal. They might, uh, you know, slightly vary in area depending on uh, how they apply it. So clearly some stuff is larger than other. So how those transistors are really fabricated so that you know how it's done in the lab. You've seen some of those images on the web probably. So transistors are not formed by pushing large chunks of NNP semiconductor anymore. That's very old style type uh, of you know, technology. Now transistors are made by bombarding silicon with doping substances to create the layers for each junction. Surface is then oxidized in between the stages to ensure that only the necessary sections are dot. So that's the only way to do it if you want to make transistors are really, really small, right? So you can't really do this manually as it was done at the beginning. So this is, if you're interested, shows that the existing fabrication process on how uh, things are bombarded, uh, bombarded with a certain type of atoms and how you create essentially the same type of diagram, right? but just in a very small scale at the nanometer level. Okay. So this is just for you to understand how it's done in practice. The process is much more complicated than here, but it just gives you basic principle. At the end, the, the logic uh, building block is, uh, is here. Okay, so this is covers everything I want to cover in the first week. We not only cover it, but we also kind of do a little bit of summary of it today. 
So I'll just show you a couple of example questions that you may get on your quiz. So you can get a feeling what the questions are like. So you can get a lot of short questions like true or false. For example, doping gives a semiconductor an overall positive or negative charge. Is it true or false? Think about it. Uh, so the answer is false. It's actually neutral. Um, or another example of questions, what kind of bias on NPN junctions causes the depletion layer to expand. You know, if you read the slides carefully, you would know that expansion uh, happens when you do reverse bias. Forward bias make it shrink. Another simple question is phosphorus has five electrons in its outer valence shell. When added in small amounts to silicon, what the result is? Uh, and essentially the, the result is it's stopped and it's top uh, in a certain way to the n-type, right? Because you get an extra electron, so it becomes more negative, okay? So slightly bigger questions are like, if electrons are traveling from the bottom of the battery to the top, which way is current set to be traveling? Remember, we were said that there is a convention there, so we assume things travel from plus to minus. So the current is measured as the movement of the positive charges, even though protons uh, are not really moving. And uh, so some transistors reviews, it's uh, so questions like this might happen in the exam. So logic gates are built, uh, so not not the exams on the quiz. Logic gates are built from transistors. Uh, how is this visual transistor is called? This is called NMOS. Uh, it conducts and acts as a closed switch if we apply by volts at its gates. And if you get the small circle there, this transistor is called PMOS and it conducts electricity if you apply zero volts to its gate. Okay, so uh, there can be more complicated questions like this. So we'll show you the diagram, right? And we might ask you a question, which gate this represents. And I showed you just a few slides ago, uh, that was a NAND gate, okay. This is just to give you a feeling of what kind of questions you can get in the quiz. Again, you see, there's not gonna be any surprises. Like everything was covered in the lectures. The quiz is not to grill you, the quiz is there to enforce, make sure that you read material every week so you stay uh, up to it and understand what it is, okay? So this is everything I have today. So I'm happy to take any questions right now on this week's material. Well, like we don't really have a way to enforce it. Right, so uh, ideally uh, it would be better if you uh, reasonably understand what it is. Uh, the limitation is the time, right? If you're gonna search for every answer in your slide deck, it won't take you too long. So I still encourage you and do it by yourself, but we don't have a way to enforce anything. Doping results in the neutral church, that's correct, but it's unstable in the sense it's now much easier to change it to be charged. Then if you try to apply electricity to silicon, silicon itself a very good insulator, nothing is gonna go through it, right? So doped version would be uh, more susceptible to movement than the normal material, but it's still neutral. It doesn't really have more pluses or minuses in it. Any other questions? Okay. So if there are no more questions, then thank you guys for coming for today's lecture. As usual, um, sometime later, we're gonna publish the, the video and the slides uh, for today. But most of the slides I showed today were in the previous slide deck as well. We we'll just finish it up, okay? And good luck with your first lap and I hope you're enjoying the class. So please, uh, you know, 
keep asking any extra new questions on Piazza, your TAs will help you. I will help as well if they're not uh, be able to answer it quickly. Okay, thanks a lot for coming and enjoy the class. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Have a nice weekend.